Hello, and thank you for joining us. I'm Gwen Taylor, Senior Developmental Editor with Current Protocols at John Wiley & Sons, and I'm delighted to introduce today's webinar titled Overcoming Sample-Related Challenges for LSPOT and Other Functional T-Cell Assays to Produce More Reliable Immune Monitoring. This webinar is being co-sponsored by Current Protocols and EMD Millipur. EMD Millipur is the Life Sciences Division of Merck KGAA of Germany and helps customers prepare and analyze samples in academic, pharmaceutical, and applied research environments. The company is excited to apply its immunology expertise to applications to monitor immune responses and immunological response patterns, and also to identify antigenic peptides and create vaccination strategies. Current Protocols has been in continuous publication for 28 years and is the largest collection of peer-reviewed, authoritative, and regularly updated step-by-step -step research techniques and procedures available for life scientists worldwide. With 17 titles and over 17,000 protocols, Current Protocols is part of Wiley Publishers. During today's program, we encourage you to submit your questions throughout the event by clicking on the Ask a Question box at the bottom of your screen. The question will not be seen by any of the other attendees. The webinar will be recorded and available for viewing in the next few days. We will send you an email with details of how to access the recorded webinar along with a PDF of the slides and a certificate of attendance. So now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Sylvia Janeski is founder and president of Zelnet Consulting, a company specializing in the Ellispot technique. Dr. Janeski is also the initiator and coordinator of the Proficiency Panel Program of the Cancer Immunotherapy Consortium, a program of the Cancer Research Institute in New York, and currently the largest program of its kind involving more than 100 laboratories worldwide. The program focuses on common immune monitoring assays, including Ellispot, and has contributed to the publication of assay harmonization guidelines. So let's get started with a very warm welcome to you, Dr. Janetsky. Thank you very much, and welcome everybody to our seminar that is focused on sample-related challenges for Ellispot and other functional T-cell assays and possible solutions to produce more reliable immune monitoring. The subtopics for this seminar are how to obtain samples, and we will look at PBMCs and tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, and how to preserve their functionality, looking at isolation, transport, and storage, the purity of the sample, and optimization steps. Now, let's start with the most patient-friendly sample, the blood or PBMC, because they're easy to obtain non-invasively and can be obtained in abundance and repeatedly. And at the end, we have a good idea what we get and what we can do with that. Now, the first question for functional immune monitoring is, can we use whole blood or do we, do we need to purify PBMCs? And as a rule of thumb, with the exception, with very rare exceptions, it is that we have to purify peripheral blood mononuclear cells. Only for structural testing like phenotyping, multimer testing, TCR sequencing, you can also use whole blood. With that, the question is, which anticoagulants are the best to use? Now, there are quite a lot of reports and mixed reports out there, but most consistently positive are reports about using heparin, with the optimal choice of using lithium heparin. I would like to refer to the two references on the bottom by Malone and Hofmeister that give excellent guidance for immune monitoring and which anticoagulants to use for which assay. Let's have a look at some of the crucial steps when isolating peripheral blood mononuclear cells. Perhaps the most crucial steps of all of them is the time lapse between blood draw and freezing. It has been shown convincingly, convincingly by various groups that you need to isolate PBMCs and freeze them in less than eight hours. An example is shown from a Fred Hutch group around Bull that has tested different donors using different anticoagulants and isolating PBMCs either after 24 hours of storage, these are the gray bars, or within eight hours of storage. The readout here is early spot, and you can clearly see that if PBMCs were isolated 
within eight hours, the response status was much higher and stronger than uh, compared to time slots when uh, PBMCs were uh, isolated after 24 hours. Now let's have a look how those logistics uh, look like for clinical trials. If you have multiple clinical sites, you of course need to obtain blood drawn from patients. You need to isolate PBMCs and freeze those, and you need to isolate serum and freeze those. And uh, lastly, they have to undergo your functional testing. The key issues here are that you need a lab that can isolate PBMCs and freeze those, that can isolate serum and freeze the serum, and that can run the functional testing. And an optimal solution would be that all three steps can be accomplished in one lab. However, there are various challenges, and the major challenge is the time lapse between blood draw and PBMC isolation and freezing. And I just showed you how crucial the time lapse and staying below eight hours is for functionality of cells. Now, most clinical sites are simply not able to isolate and freeze PBMCs. And as a matter of fact, there exists only a limited number of labs that actually can isolate PBMCs and store them and run the functional assay and other testing and all of that under required quality standards. Let's have a look at different scenarios possible. The first scenario is that blood is obtained in the clinical lab and cells are uh, isolated right at the clinical site, the serum is isolated, both are frozen and then shipped to the central lab where functional testing can be done later. The pro of that scenario is that the PBMC preparation is potentially within the optimal time frame and there's a direct connection to the central lab. However, this approach with training of the clinical sites, the correct equipment at clinical sites, and the compliance of the clinical sites provides a huge logis logistical challenge. Hence, a typical scenario found out there is that while the uh, a blood is drawn at the clinical site, the blood is then transported by courier to qualified nearby labs where PBMC isolation and serum isolation is done and both of them are frozen and then shipped to the central lab for functional testing. The pro of that is that the PBMC preparation will be done potentially within the optimal time frame and to deal with labs that are qualified to do both of those steps. However, you need to identify and qualify those nearby labs and you need to use a messenger service which can add certain costs to your uh, monitoring setup. And unfortunately, not all clinical sites are close to such qualified nearby labs. Hence, a third scenario is perhaps currently still the most common scenario out there, and that is that clinical sites draw blood and the blood is shipped directly to the central lab where it will be further processed and, test and tested. Now, the logistics are easy. However, the biggest issue with this approach is that the whole blood shipment, which can be, can be exposed to various temperature variations during the shipment, uh, might not be processed within the time frame that I just uh, mentioned to you, and PBMCs are typically frozen after 24 or 48 hours. And with that, you have a potential loss of functionality. Now, what causes the decline of functionality? The main culprit are granulocytes. Granulocytes get activated as soon as blood is stored and further activated during prolonged storage. Now, activated granulocytes change their buoyancy profile and can't be effectively separated when phycoling, meaning they contaminate PBMCs even without you knowing that you have granulocytes in there. If you run an LA spot assay, those granulocytes can then be bound by the FC portion of the standard capture antibody in the LA spot assay and further activated. 
What this specifically leads to is a physical disruption of the spot formation. But more importantly, the granulocyte activation during prolonged storage, as well as on the early spot plate, lead to the activation of arginase and the release of hydrogen peroxide, which leads to further downregulation of the CD3 Z chain expression and interference with the TCR signal transduction, which suppresses T cell function. I would like to show you an example of how granulocyte contamination affects the outcome of an early spot assay. We know now that contamination levels of more than 20% have a significant impact. You see here three examples on the top panel with a contamination level of around 9% and the lower level uh, in the lower panel of 40% granulocyte contamination. Clearly, you can see how the contamination level affects the early spot responsiveness here against SIV and SEB. If you look at the pictures on the very right side, you see how the spot quality gets worse and worse with higher contamination levels. And you see on the lower right-hand side, the image represents a, a clear disintegration of spots due to binding of the granulocytes by the capture antibody. So you might say, I am just simply not able to get the blood uh, process within eight hours. Are there options uh, that I can rely on? I would like to introduce four different options to you that you may uh, work with and that uh, may give you a, a solution to that problem. First of it, I will talk about dilution of blood. I will introduce some options for granulocyte removal. I will talk about transportation, and I will talk about a specific blood collection container, the CPT vacutanus. Let's have a look at the dilution of blood. These results come from a group of the University of Pittsburgh around McKenna. They obtained blood from a donor and isolated PBMC either immediately seen on the bottom of the slide by FRESH and uh, measured the contamination level with, uh, with granulocytes. And fresh, the FRESH sample was set to zero. The next tube was stored for eight hours at room temperature. Then they did the PBMC isolation and they found approximately two-fold increase of granulocyte contamination. Others, uh, other tubes they let stand for 24 hours at room temperature. When they then isolate the PBMC, they found an 11-fold increase in granulocyte contamination. And if they expose those PBMC, uh, the, the, the blood for 24 hours to 4 degrees Celsius, the granulocyte contamination increased to almost 100-fold. Interestingly, though, if they diluted the blood after, after they drew the blood from the donor, one-to-one -one was plain RPMI or PBS. Let it stand for 24 hours at room temperature. The granulocyte contamination level went back uh, to a two- to four-fold uh, um, uh, factor that is very similar to the eight-hour room temperature um, uh, storage. Now, if you look at granulocyte removal possibilities. There are two options available. One uh, is offered by Oxford Immunotech. It's a kit that is called T-cell Extend, which offers an antibody cocktail that crosslinks red blood cells and granulocytes for effective removal during, uh, of granulocytes during fight calling. However, there are only limited data available and only for use of freshly isolated PBMCs. In a study that was done in collaboration of Zelnet and Viracore, we found no effect on the functionality of PBMCs when using this kit. And it makes all sense because it is not efficient to preserve functionality. Because as I showed you before, granulocytes get activated right after drawing blood. If you store that blood for 24 hours, the damage is already done, even if you remove granulocytes um, during fight calling. However, there might be a 
better option available, and that is if you can remove granulocytes right after blood draw with the whole blood depletion quick sap CD15 kits. This kit contains ferromagnetic beads that can be added directly to the blood. This is an efficient method, but unfortunately I have not seen any publications out there uh, using this kit. It's a new method uh, just recently introduced by Russell Biotech. In the graph you see an effective removal of granulocytes uh, on the light blue bars show the granulocyte level or other cell levels, the undepleted blood, and the dark blue ones show the levels of cells after CD15 depletion. Importantly, you can see here that while this kit removes granulocytes effective, effectively, the monocyte population is not affected. The pro of that uh, procedure is that it is easy and fast. You add those beads to whole blood, you incubate just for five minutes, you use a magnetic holder and transfer the whole blood into a new, blood, uh, into a new tube. However, the clinical site needs to have sterile working capabilities available. Let's have a look at transportation of blood at ambient temperature. The results I'm showing you here come from Craig Slingloff's lab. He monitored multiple shipments during an entire year uh, that were actually shipped at ambient temperature. If you see on the graph on the top panel, those shipments that were shipped during the summer were actually shipped during ambient temperature, while those shipments that were shipped during winter months were exposed to colder temperatures, even though they were supposed to be shipped at ambient temperature, the samples were exposed to low temperatures down to zero degrees. The study then examined the impact of using recyclable gel packs, and the recommendation from the study is that if you ship uh, a whole blood during winter months, warm those gel packs up to 37 degrees and, and uh, use them in your package. And uh, during the summer months, use room, te room temperature gel packs. Uh, and again, you can recycle those gel packs uh, again and again for each shipment. Lastly, I would uh, point your attention to some blood collection container that provide a closed system for collection, cell separation, and transport of blood. Those tubes are called CPT vacutainers and are available from BD. They contain FICOL, a gel plug, um, and a, a as I mentioned, a closed blood collection system. After blood drawing, those cells need, uh, those tubes need to be centrifuged, and you have your erythrocytes and neutrophils. Um, accumulated during, uh, under the gel plug, where the PBMC layer and the plasma is contained above the gel plug. After centrifugation, the lab can invert that tube five to ten times and mix the PBMC layer with the plasma, ship those tubes at room temperature, and uh, uh, upon arrival, the upper layer then has to be transferred into a new tube washed, uh, washed, and then PBMCs can be ice, uh, uh, frozen away. Typically, this procedure has a, comes with a slightly higher platelet and granulocyte contamination. And the technique's success depends highly on the centrifugation speed, temperature, and the time length of the centrifugation. The pro of this uh, procedure is that you do not need sterile working environment, and you, uh, you hope that your, your clinical lab can do uh, the centrifugation. This is all they have to do. However, as I just mentioned, the success of this method relies heavily on following the exact centrifugation protocol, and you need to provide the clinical site with a proper centrifuge. These uh, uh, tubes are a little bit longer than typical blood collection tubes, hence you need to have the correct uh, uh, centrifuge available. Now, if you stick to the typical 
Uh, PBMC isolation, I would just like to uh, point out that there are special tubes available that contain a barrier. Those tubes are called Nucosep or Acuspin tubes. They can be pre-filled with FICOL, and blood can just be added uh, uh, to those tubes without uh, over or underlaying techniques. Importantly, you do not even need to dilute the blood. You need enough erythrocytes to push the PBMC ring over that barrier. This method is fast and it avoids variability and is an advantage for even an inexperienced operator. Now, for freezing, there are many different methods available. A Mr. Frosty that is used in most labs is just fine and so are temperature controlled freezers. I would like to point your attention to an even easier uh, method that is provided with a cool cell system that uses a thermal conductive alloy core. When you, you just simply add your, your freezing vials into that little container that doesn't use any isopropanol or similar, and you uh, put it in an 80 degree, minus 80 degree freezer. The radially symmetric thermal exchange design provides a perfect drop of temperature of one degree Celsius per minute, as shown on the bottom figure. When you freeze, we know now uh, you have to make an important choice, and that is the freezing medium. Here you see an example where the same cells were frozen with three different freezing media, A, B, and C, and tested by lab one and lab two in Ellie Spot for responsiveness against two different antigens. And you can clearly deduce from this slide that depending on the freezing medium and the following SOP, the, the final functional readout can be dramatically different. This issue has been systematically investigated by the European Association for Cancer Immunotherapy. They obtained blood and PBMCs from two different donors and froze those PBMCs uh, away with a freezing medium that was um, uh, supplemented with serum, called number A here in all of those figures, or with two serum free media, B and C, one commercially available and one self-made with HSA. They sent those PBMCs to 31 labs in nine countries and let those labs use their own SOP to test those PBMCs for, uh, specific, uh, against three peptide antigens. What they found, and it was published in 2012, that cells that were frozen without serum had at least a high viability as uh, uh, cells that were frozen with serum. Cells that were frozen without serum had at least a high, uh, such a high recovery as serum uh, supplemented media. They had, in average, a lower resting loss than cell supplement, uh, frozen with serum supplemented medium, a lower background a spot production and a higher detection rate. I would also mention shortly that you can actually cycle cells that were frozen one time from liquid nitrogen to dry ice and back of liquid nitrogen if you need to ship frozen cells. However, for longer shipments, especially international shipments, it is recommended to use liquid nitrogen shippers, which come in various sizes. Let's have a look at the sawing procedure of cells. It is important that you do not shake cells or the, the vials while sawing because microcrystals within the cells can poke holes in the cell membrane. Please add warm sawing medium slowly, step by step, to the cells in order to prevent osmotic shock. It is also recommended to use the DNAs and uh, most reliably working as a benzonase that is available from Millipore at a nine, more than 99% pure level and endotoxin tested. Benzonase degrades DNA that is released by dying cells and with that prevents clumping. It has been shown that the recovery of cells using Benzonase can be increased by 10 to 15 percent. However, however, if you have just an excellent PBMC prep frozen away, 
the use of benzonate has no beneficial effects. The question is, are all cells that are once frozen equal? Are there any quality control and assurance parameters available? This was addressed by a group at Merck by Jeffrey, around Jeffrey Smith, and he looked at viability, PHA reactivity, and apoptosis. The readout of uh, his project was Elispot for CD4 and CD8 cells. I would like to point your attention to the apoptosis on the very right side. All of the vials that were tested here were obtained from the same donor on the same blood draw. He used different mechanisms to induce apoptosis. The degree of apoptosis is shown on the y-axis, while the readout is shown on the x-axis as spot counts on a logarithmic scale. And you can easily see for CD4 and CD8 cells that the higher the degree of apoptosis, the lower the responsiveness. They actually are using the degree of apoptosis in PBMCs that were frozen and then thawed again um, as a quality, uh, as a cutoff criterion for acceptance of PBMCs in their hands marked with 18% of apoptosis. The question, of course, is how do you know that you have apoptotic cells in your, in your PBMC prep? If you're using tripe and blue, you do not know that because apoptotic cells are counted as living cells. As a matter of fact, in our proficiency panel program, we observed that labs that use tripe and blue-based methods always reported higher viability counts than labs that used other methods that were able to distinguish apoptotic cells. So how can you best uh, assess apoptotic cells in your PBMC? In your PBMC? A very easy and time saving method was introduced by Millipore with the Muse system. I would like to show you on the next slide the significance of assessing the apoptotic fraction. These measurements were obtained with a big cousin of the Muse, the Guava Easy Sight Flow Cytometer. And the sample one here on the very left side, we gated uh, only uh, gated so that we only included, included viable cells. The viable cells is a big um, pop cell population on the very left, whereas the smaller cell population on the right are the uh, dead cells. The cells in between these two populations are the apoptotic cells. Now, if, if we would have gated to simulate tripe and blue counting, as uh, you can see on the middle panel, we would have uh, reported a higher viability, as I just showed you on the previous slide. In this case, a 6% higher viability because we included the apoptotic cells. You might say, okay, so this 6%, it's not so much. But how about uh, if I show you the second sample? This sample had a high degree of cells that just um, uh, entered apoptosis. On the very left panel, we gated out all of those apoptotic cells, and we got a live cell count of only 48%. However, if you would have counted those cells using or simulating a tripe and blue method, we would have uh, obtained a live cell count of 86%, and we would have not been aware that half of the sample use, uh, is con contains actually um, apoptotic cells. Now the question is, uh, what do apoptotic cells do? We know that apoptotic cells do not produce any spots. Uh, a study by Lenders from Belgium has shown if you mix living and apoptotic cells, you obtain less and less spot counts the more apoptotic cells you have. And that, I think, doesn't come to, uh, to much surprise. But more importantly, what they did in a second experiment is they mixed living and apoptotic cells by keeping the amount of living cells the same and added more and more apoptotic cells. Here they showed that the more apoptotic cells they added to that uh, cell mix, the lower the spot counts, specifically if they used uh, an antigen that needed further uh, uh, 
uh, uptake and processing like cell lysate or whole proteins. So the question is, can you do something about it? And of course there's an answer and that is to include an overnight resting. Already in the early proficiency panel, we have shown that labs that inclu included an overnight resting step. Here shown on this red bar um, for 24-hour rest in our upper graph here, um, <clears throat> that those labs measured a higher response than labs that did not include a resting period uh, or a very short resting period, two hours or less. And we, we uh, pointed this to the removal of apoptotic cells which would, would fi uh, finally die and could be washed, and cell debris could be washed out. But over recent years, it has been shown by Kutcher and a German group uh, with Römer and Fischer that uh, overnight resting restores functionality via multiple mechanisms, and it resets T cells to a tissue-like status. I would like to show you an early spot example. We used a PBM, we used PBMCs that were not optimally uh, obtained and frozen away, and we expected a high degree of apoptotic cells. Here you see an example of uh, the background control testing PBMCs just against medium. On the very left side, uh, you see in that picture many artifacts which are indicative for dying apoptotic cells because those cells create all those small artifacts. However, the longer we uh, rested those cells, the lower the amount of artifacts uh, became. Now, when we tested the same PBMCs against the CEF peptide pool, uh, we observed while we could measure a nice response without resting, that the response level increased dramatically with a longer, with a longer resting period. And I would show you, would like to show you uh, a very relevant example, just testing a single peptide with a very low response. On the, low, on the left image, you see just a few spots and many artifacts. However, when we rested that sample, we decreased the number of artifacts, as seen in the middle and the right image, and we uh, increased the, um, uh, the amount of spots, and with that, the responsiveness of that uh, PBMC sample. There are a few papers that mention that one should not rest cells because uh, we, uh, you end up with a higher amount of dead cells, and that is, of course, the case, as Kutcher also showed in the PLOS 1 2013 paper. Apoptotic cells are dying during resting, and what you can see nicely in the lower uh, graph, and you end up with a lower viability, slightly lower viability. However, the important part of resting is that it increases the functionality and the number of fang functions detectable. Here, using intercellular cytokine staining, on the upper panel testing CD8 cells, on the lower panel uh, testing CD4 cells, against four different cytokines. You see on the left side the no resting results, on the right side the resting results. Uh, you can clearly see th that for CD8 and for CD4 cells, you do not only increase the number of cells, as seen, for example, for CD8 cells, from 1.35 to 3.02 after resting, but you dramatically increase the number of functions that can be measured uh, per T cell from uh, again, for CD8 cells, from before resting, 80% of cells only exhibit one function, while after resting, only 10 to 15% exhibit one function, and the remaining cells exhibit either two, three, or four functions. Importantly, after overnight resting, T cells increase the sensitivity uh, against the antigen and Perhaps a question that you're asking, well, do you actually just uh, have a proliferation going on and increase the number of TCR-specific cells? And Kutcher showed very convincingly that no, you do not alter the number of TCR-specific cells. You indeed 
uh, uh, change the, the status of functionality of those cells after resting. So the question is, what happens? By, uh, it has been shown by Römer and Fischer that during a high-density prolonged culture, T cells are being reset to a tissue-like state. Now, as a matter of fact, T cells are 99% of T cells are typically contained in tissue, and only 1% are contained in the circulation. This is a part that we are evaluating with our immune monitoring. Now, when cells enter the circulation coming from the tissue, they start to lose their primed stage. That happens by downregulating the expression of phosphotyrosine, which is important for the signal complex assembly. And uh, a, uh, the cells ex um, have a low level of functional maturation due to low levels of cellular interaction and they exhibit a low sensitivity to the TCR signal. However, after 24, even longer high-density culture, they regain the phosphotyrosine expression for signal complex assembly. And due to the tonic TCR signals provided from HLA scanning, they exhibit a higher functional maturation and upregulate the sensitivity to the TCR signal, with other words, are being reset to a tissue-like state. I would like to switch heads for a moment and look at tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. We know that different subsets of leukocytes in the tumor shape the microenvironment via the factors they produce. Hence, evaluating tumor infiltrating lymphocyte became extremely important. If you look at TIL assessment, you have different assays available. Now, I won't even go further into it that it might be important to differentiate between stromal and intratumoral tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. However, if you look at the different assays, FFPE tissue is sufficient for immunohistochemistry, gene expression analysis, and TCR sequencing. However, if you go to phenotyping analysis or functional analysis, you need to isolate the TILs again. And the rule of thumb is that the same rules apply as we just discussed for the blood samples. So you need to dissociate the tumor first uh, mechanically and further degrade uh, the extracellular matrix enzymatically. The single cell suspension can be used for phenotyping, gene analysis, and proteomic analysis. However, for the functional analysis, you need to further culture or isolate TILs until you can evaluate them by flow cytometry, LE spot, Luminex, or other assays. The perhaps best solution available for that is uh, provided by Milton E. They provide specific tissue storage solutions specific dissociation tubes and dissociation kits, kits that can be used with the gentle max dissociators um, that also come with cell strainers and filters. You can then further downstream isolate uh, the tilts using magnetic beads and then either freeze them and test them or directly test them with your functional assay. It is recommended that you use the FCR, uh, FCR blocking and dead cell removal kit uh, with, uh, after you do the till isolation. I would like to give you a few important updates for downstream testing, specifically the ELI spot, before uh, I finish this presentation. I would like to point out that the polyfunctional assessment uh, is now possible with ELI spot using fluorescent dyes coupled to the secondary antibody. Uh, there are two really good publications out there that might help you with this technique by Dylan Beck, uh, and, uh, by Dylan Beck and Cells 2015 and another publication about the evaluation of those uh, fluorospot assays. Further, Millipore has just introduced uh, new and improved multi-screen HTS plates that have an increased distance between the membrane and the underdrain to prevent capillary attraction and leaking. And they also induced fluorospot plates with low autofluorescent PVDF membranes. 
I also would like to point your attention to a paper that was just published by Bittmann uh, from Mainz in Germany showing the usefulness of TCR-engineered T-cells as reference samples for various assays as ICS, LE spot, or multimer staining. Those cells will be made and those kits will be made uh, available uh, further or later this year uh, on a commercial basis. And lastly, I would like to make you aware of a publication that is Impress in Nature Protocols that addresses consensus harmonization guidelines for LE spot plate evaluation, one of the main factors for variability in LE spot. Now, lastly, where do you find more information about how other groups do uh, process their samples and store their samples? And you find those in the other compliant papers. And I, I truly hope that everybody on this call has heard of MIATA. MIATA stands for me Minimal Information About T-Cell Assays. The MIATA project was introduced to the community in 2009 in uh, uh, Immunity, and the final consensus guidelines were published in 2012. MIATA gives, gu gives guidance on how to report in publications on the sample, the assay, the data acquisition results, and the lab environment. And it gives exact guidance on how to structure materials and methods accordingly. MIATA compliant papers are actually introduced to the MIATA Hall of Fame, which can be, can be found on miataproject.org. And I strongly recommend to visit, visit the MIATA uh, website it lists all MIATA compliant papers and links back to the online paper. In all of them, you find exact information how people handled the samples and processed the sample uh, for their uh, follow-up T-cell assays. With that, I would uh, like to thank you very much for the introduction. We will open the lines now for any questions that you may have. All right, so let's get started. The first question is, is the granulocyte activation patient-specific? Can you comment on this? Um, excellent question. The data that I showed you were actually obtained with healthy, uh, uh, from he healthy donors. Um, so the granulocyte activation goes on in any donor, whether patient or healthy. However, there is a really good paper by uh, Teresa Whiteside a couple of years back that shows that in cancer patients, they could uh, see um, a uh, increased uh, release of hydrogen peroxide with the downstream effects of uh, granulocyte suppressing functionality. So there has not been much done to look at it further, but in general, I think there's evidence that, for example, certain diseases might have a stronger suppression of functionality than in healthy donors, what I showed you before. All right, next question. Would you recommend the overnight resting to reduce the effects of apoptotic cells for a flow cytometer phenotypic analysis? Um, <laughs> so I, I don't believe that it will do anything to the phenotypic analysis because the, uh, we know that overnight resting of doesn't increase the number of cells. Uh, you m get rid of some of the apoptotic cells, so the only difference you might see is that you have less apoptotic cells and more dead cells um, in, your, uh, uh, in your mix uh, of cells. However, the main effect of overnight resting um, is on, on functionality. Now, uh, you're saying that, I think you said for five to six hours or so, this is a quite short time. Uh, even though you're referring to phenotyping, I would say that it is important that you, if you look at functionality testing, that you need to prolong the overnight resting to at least 16 to 24 hours, perhaps even a little bit longer if possible. All right, next question. Uh, what is the best freezing media to maintain T-cell activity? Uh, 
can't give you one specific answer. I would love to. Uh, the study I showed you by that was done by the Kim organization in Europe showed that if you use a pre-tested and qualified serum, your cells might be just fine. However, there is a, the study provided a lot of evidence that overnight, uh, I'm sorry, overnight, I'm, I'm still on my first, previous question, that using um, serum-free media might be a more reliable way of uh, uh, preserving functionality specifically for lower background reactivity and higher responsiveness. You can make your, uh, um, you can make a freezing medium yourself with HSA. If you're interested, please drop me an email and I'm happy to send you a protocol how to do that. Okay, next question. So you said that one cycle of liquid nitrogen, dry ice, and then liquid nitrogen does not harm the cells. Does that mean that we can ship the PBMCs in dry ice? Correct. So what I was referring to is if you have your PBMCs stored in liquid nitrogen and you need to, or your, your clinical lab uh, needs to ship them and they know they can ship overnight to the central lab or to a collaborating lab, yes, you can put them on uh, dry ice, ship them and uh, at, at the receiving end they should be put back on uh, liquid nitrogen. Actually, the the data came out uh, from Jeffrey Merck's group, uh, Jeffrey Smith's group at Merck, um, and they have done multi or set up multiple testing rounds. What they show is if you go into repeated cycling of liquid nitrogen, dry ice, liquid nitrogen, then ship again on dry ice, then you start to drop in functionality. Okay, next question. Uh, regarding the resting protocol that you described, is this restricted to only frozen specimens or is it recommended for the fresh PBMCs as well? And is this transportation time counted towards the resting phase? Two questions. All right. So um, if it's not the first time I get this question, but I have no data to show you. Uh, and if you have it, uh, that would be great to share it with me. Um, it, people typically do overnight resting after they freeze. However, I can imagine, but this is just speculative, that if you have fresh cells, remember I showed you you have cells from the circulation, and you would like to reset them to the tissue-like state that overnight resting may even help for freshly isolated cells. However, again, I am not aware of any publication yet uh, that proves this point. And I'm sorry, uh, what was the second part of the question? I forgot. Um, does the transportation time count towards the resting phase time? To, uh, transportation time. Um, I would like to say no because uh, the resting requires a, a, a special environment, including high density, so typically you do it in 50 ml tubes. You need uh, gas exchange. You need to put your cells in an incubator. You need gas exchange, and you need 37 degrees Celsius. I don't think that the transport can provide that, so no, it would not. All right, next question. Can I use tissue culture flasks for the overnight resting of the PBMCs? I highly, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, no, let's make, let's make it easy, uh, <laughs> no. And, and the reason for that is um, during that time, your, your monocytes will stick to the tissue culture coated uh, um, surface, and you will lose those cells during that overnight resting. You might need them later in early spot and other assays for uh, antigen presentation. So no, please stick to 50 ml tubes. Again, I'm happy to send out uh, a, um, a protocol to anybody who's interested for an optimal uh, overnight resting, uh, for overnight, optimal overnight resting. All right, next question. Uh, do you know the comparison of yield between using CPT and the heparin vacutainer tubes? There are multiple uh, papers out there. They all differ a little bit in, in, in their conclusions, but overall the results are very similar. Uh, it, 
I have seen some papers that say CPT tubes have a slightly lower uh, recovery, but it also depends on whether you use the CPT tubes right away, uh, uh, FICOL, and isolate the PBMC ring, or if you ship them. Uh, but in general, I say they are very comparable. Okay, next question. Um, have you seen the Ellispot results from PBMCs isolated 24 hours after shipping that was diluted with PBS prior to shipping? And then the next part of the question is, you showed very nicely the decreased granulite, granulocyte contamination, but what did the Ellispot look like? The decrease of granulocytes, I assume you mentioned, um, I showed that using the, the, um, uh, the, the ferromagnetic beads. So I start with the second part. There are no publications out there. This is a very new method introduced. Unfortunately, I have no data showing you on LA Spot. So we haven't tried it yet. We haven't published yet. Um, so if anybody has used them, this would be great. This is a introduction to this method. So um, again, I have no data on that. The first part, could you repeat this again, Gwen, please? Um, the first part of the question was talking about um, the Ellis spot results from PBMCs isolated 24 hours after shipping, um, after being diluted with PBS prior mm -hmm. to shipping. Showed the decreased granulite, granulocyte contamination, right. but they asked what does the Ellis spot, so you've answered that essentially? And uh, actually, um, there's um, a organization that uses this method, and I have talked to them before, that is a diabetes uh, network, and they have to do this uh, for certain clinical sites. And I spoke with Roberto Malone, who says that the LA spot looks much better. I believe he has published this also. There is a review um, of the Diabetes Society T-cell workshop um, that was published a couple of years back. And uh, they have a review of their data, mainly on LA Spot, uh, actually published in there. All right, next question. Uh, you showed some LA Spot well images with and without overnight resting. I sometimes have a ring of dark, small speckles in the well periphery, similar to the artifacts that you showed. Are these artifacts also from apoptotic cells? Very likely, yes. Um, if you see those little speckles in the periphery of your well, uh, small and all around, and they could be across a whole, whole plate, a whole well, but typically they accumulate in a well periphery. They are typically caused by dying cells during incubation, a great, actually a great uh, quality control for your cells um, that you receive after you run the assay. Yes, typically they are. Okay. Next question. For shipment of tumors, what is the best method to maintain activity of the tills? Is shipment in the Miltenyi storage buffer with cold gel packs efficient? They say yes. Uh, they have, uh, as you mentioned, and I think I showed it on the slide, they have these special solutions uh, uh, um, available for tumor tissue that prevents any activation um, but keeps functionality Good. I think they go from 24 to even 48 hours. We haven't tested the 48 hours, so I am not sure about that. But yes, this should be uh, sufficient. All right. Got some great questions here. Just a few more. Uh, during the resting time period, do you need to add cytokines to the media to preserve the T cell viability? And do you have, if so, do you have an optimized protocol? Um, no, you don't need to add anything. And, uh, you know, very interesting, in, uh, as part of our proficiency panels with the CIC, we actually ran a study for where we sent out diff different media, serum supplemented and uh, serum free to various numbers of labs, and they had to test PBMCs. All of those labs included an overnight resting step. And truly surprising. Um, even media that had no serum in them, and they were not supplemented with any other cytokines, did just fine. And a matter of fact, they did actually slightly better than the serum supplemented medium that uh, those labs were using. So no, you do not need to add anything. 
Was there a okay. second part to it? Uh, I no. believe not right now. <laughs> okay. No. Um, next is, uh, in summary then, do you recommend both the guava counting plus resting before Ellispot? Yes. Yes, you don't need to use, I don't think you necessarily need to use a big guava, but uh, something based uh, uh, or any method that gives you a readout for uh, apoptosis. Yes, absolutely, you should do that. You need to adjust the viability counts also um, to play the correct number out in LE spot. And you may want to consider using the degree of apoptosis, as I showed you in one slide, as a acceptance criterion for, uh, for PBMCs that you're about to test. Uh, you might recall the one slide that I showed you that if you have a high degree, if it's the same symbol, if um, you have a high degree of apoptosis, the number you're measuring is actually just a house number. It doesn't mean anything because apoptosis suppresses functionality. So, yes, I highly recommend to do that. All right, next question. Uh, do you recommend a specific commercially available serum free freezing media, or do you have a protocol for an in-house media preparation? We do not use an in-house uh, medium, but uh, I just um, pointed out the, the study that we ran um, uh, to the CIC panel. We tested four commercially available serum free media some very common that I think most most of people that are on this call know, like Ex Vivo, AM5, and they work all just fine. So no, I think commercially available are just fine. All right. Well, we are just about out of time, so I'm going to wrap up the question and answer session now. I'd like to tell you that today's webinar has been recorded and will be available for viewing in the next few days. We'll send you each an email with details on how to access the recorded webinar along with a PDF of the slides and instructions on how to personalize and print a certificate of attendance. So on behalf of today's speaker, Dr. Sylvia Janetsky, and from me, Gwen Taylor, and our sponsor, EMD Millipore, we sincerely appreciate your attending today's webinar and hope you learned some very valuable information. So this concludes today's webinar, and we look forward to your attendance at future events from Current Protocols.